10. What's happening? Cass yelled. He'd been in the process of removing himself from in between one of the back compartments when the cockpit went dark and he found himself being lifted off the deck plating by the sensation of zero gravity. Outside the main view screen, the planet rushed forward at an alarming pace. Had they lost all power and thrust? None of the systems are responding, Uma yelled. I can't get anything to work. We have to evacuate, Evie replied. Emergency packs. We'll have to jump. She was two meters off the ground already, floating near the ceiling. The rest of the cockpit crew were still strapped in, but since their stations were dead, it did them no good. How long until we hit the surface? Cass asked. 1.7 minutes, Zal replied. They had to do something to restart the engines. Cass tried to think. Shuttles couldn't just lose power automatically. Like a starship, they had multiple backup systems in place to keep such an event from happening. And the shuttles hadn't suffered the damage Tempest had, so all the backups should still be online. So what could have knocked out the ship and the backups all at once? You guys get the packs. I'm going for the engines, he said. The ship jerked forward and cast dropped to the ground, smacking his face against the floor plating. It knocked the wind out of him and took him a second to breathe. Assuming the power was back on, he glanced up to see the cockpit still dark and Evie beside him, pushing herself up. What happened? Comms? Evie asked. We don't have anything, Zal said. All systems are still down. They weren't falling as fast anymore, but something was keeping them from crashing headfirst into the forest floor. He scrambled up and peered out the window between River and Rond until he found his answer. The Space Wings, he said. They saved us. What? Evie asked. She came up beside him, and he pointed. Each of the space wings had deployed their grapplers to hold on to the shuttle. Cass couldn't tell if their power was out, too. But even if it was, their wingspan was large enough they could glide down if necessary. I need to go check something. Cass turned and ran from the cockpit. What? Evie asked, jogging after him. Making his way through the different sections of the shuttle, he jumped over people, crates, and anything else that had come loose in the fall. There was a fair amount of blood, probably from people who hadn't been as lucky as he and Evie had. But he didn't see anything serious. Zax could take care of them when they reached the surface. She was on one of the other shuttles in their group. The cargo bay was another story. Half the supplies had toppled over, and some had even broken up, spilling foodstuffs all over the floor. But they'd have to deal with that later. Right now, they had more important things to consider. Everyone, hold on to something in here, Cass yelled to the few people still in the cargo hold, most of them checking themselves for injury. That's an order! At that, they snapped to attention, grabbing onto netting, handle holds, or anything else that might keep them in place. What are you doing? Evie asked. We need to find out if we lost anyone. Cass thought of all the shuttles in the formation. If they all lost power, too, it could be a massacre. He reached the rear ramp of the shuttle and stood by the primary door, looping his hand around some of the netting that had held one of the cargo containers off to the side. There was only one way to do this without power. He opened the control panel and flipped the manual release handle. Normally, a klaxon would have accompanied this. But without anything to power it, the system was silent. He indicated Evie do the same as him and take some of the netting as it was still attached to the floor. She wrapped it around her shoulder and nodded. Get to the other side of the door. We'll have to lift at the same time, Cass said. Two of the crew who had been to the back saw what they were doing and came to assist, also making sure they were secured by the netting. Ready? Everyone left on three. One, two, three. He strained, pulling up with all his might until he felt the door begin to budge. Everyone pulled at once and finally it lifted out of the way. They were greeted with a shock of cold air smacking them in the face, but it was breathable. But what interested Cass was the scene beyond. It was like looking at a giant spider web. Each of the four space wings had used their grapplers to impale the shuttles at crucial points, keeping them all in the air. Cass did a quick count. I think we're missing one, he yelled over the rush of air. A pained look formed over Evie's face, 
and she scanned the mini armada. She nodded. Cass looked behind them for any evidence of smoke or fire, but saw nothing. Maybe the other shuttle didn't make it all the way through the atmosphere. Or maybe they were already too far away to see it in the distance. They were still descending at a quick pace, quicker than Cass would have liked if they couldn't slow down. Had the same thing happened to Wave 1? Had they lost power as soon as they'd come through the atmosphere? He glanced up. The space wings weren't using their thrusters either, instead gliding on their long wings. Their grapplers were pneumatic and could be launched without power. Whatever affected the shuttles affected the space wings too. It was something they'd have to deal with once they landed. The air was growing warmer and the surface closer, though Cass still didn't like how fast they were coming in. The space wings needed to pull back. Can you tell what they're doing? Evie yelled. He shook his head. All he could see was that each shuttle was dangling from the grapplers, swaying back and forth as the tops of the trees only grew closer and the speed of the shuttles became more and more apparent. Cass estimated they had to be moving at close to 60 or 70 kph. A thought occurred to him. Get the hatch shut, he yelled, reaching up for the door above them. Confusion turned to action when the first of the shuttles behind them fell out of view into the trees. Immediately, the space wings banked, coming around, and a second shuttle disappeared in behind the first. They're dropping us! Cass yanked down to the hatch, but it wouldn't close as easily as it opened. If they fell with it still open, everything inside could come tumbling out, knocking the four of them off with it. The space wings banked again. The shuttles were now skirting the very tops of the trees. A third and fourth shuttle dropped out of view, creating holes in the canopy where they fell. Cass gave one more hard yank, and the door started to move. The four of them pushed down, forcing the door closed. Before Cass could get to the panel to lock it down, there was that familiar sense of zero gravity as he was lifted off his feet and into the air with everything else that wasn't strapped down. "'Grab onto something and brace,' he said. The door had started to open again, but there was nothing they could do about it now. Before he even had the chance to hold on to something other than the netting, there was a massive crash as the room turned on its side and sticks and leaves scraped the small opening made by the door. Cass hit the sidewall with his shoulder, feeling something pop while unsecured crates tumbled all over the room. He'd lost sight of the others. It was all he could do to hang on to the netting for dear life and hope the shuttle would come to a rest. There was one last great jolt, and he was thrown half across the room, landing on an errant crate that had already spilled open. It took him a moment to realize they weren't moving any longer, and the sensation he felt was nothing more than his mind playing tricks on him. He pushed himself off the crate, noting it had dug into his side. He'd have a massive bruise there later. He tried to move his right arm, but it hurt too much, so he let it hang loose. Hello? he called out. Where is everyone? Here. Evie pushed a crate off herself. It had landed on her back, but she stood, no worse for wear. You okay? Yeah, just a scratch, she replied, dusting her hands. She went to work helping the others up, though they had a few more injuries. No one seemed to be dead yet. Cass made his way back through the middle section of the shuttle, checking on all the crew who had been in the compartments. Most seemed okay, though there were a few head injuries he wanted Zax to check out as soon as they got their bearings. He told them all to stay put for the time being. When he reached the cockpit, the first person he saw was Zal at his side with his hood down, exposing his robotic head. Cass ran over to him. Are you okay? I will be fine. See to the others, he said. Cass didn't like the way he held the side of his armature's body. Lieutenant Uma was still strapped to her chair, as were River and Rond, though they all looked like they'd been through hell. Despite the large windows of the shuttle, it was still dark inside, probably because the planet's star was on the far side of the horizon, dipping below on its transition to night. In front of them, the canopy of the jungle opened up to a wide plain, and Cass caught the space wings banking one last time before coming into land. Despite not having power themselves, They'd managed to save the shuttles.
The other three space wings landed in a similar fashion, all coming to a stop approximately a hundred meters from their shuttle. Cass ventured to guess they tried to drop all the shuttles relatively close to each other. Evie came into the cockpit behind him. I guess we made it. Yeah, Cass said, looking around at the dark room. So now what do we do? Eleven. Same as before? Wolf asked. Lost contact at the exact same point, Zenvor replied. Tyler made a clicking noise in his throat and walked to the other side of engineering, his back to them. Fuck! Wolf ran her hand over her smooth head. It was nice not having to deal with hair again. It felt more natural. She'd been rocking the mohawk much too long. Even Chris had said as much. She never took his advice about her appearance, not until she was ready to. She surveyed the few of them left in engineering, finding she was surrounded by a bunch of non-humans, a first in her experience. Though she'd much rather be with these people than some of the humans she'd worked with in the past, especially back in the Hiawatha. She shook her head. I don't care what the captain said. I'm not sending what's left of us down there to die if the first two waves are gone. We're just going to have to come up with another solution. Well, what about the remaining shuttles? Reed suggested. How, how long will their life support last? She cut her eyes to him. Not nearly long enough. We've got 32 individuals, not counting Sester and Zenfor here, and enough power and air in the shuttles to last maybe two weeks. And the systems have to be off for four, correct? Zenfor nodded. At least. Okay, then. I'm taking command of this ship. We have no idea how the captain and the rest of them are even still alive, and until we get confirmation they are, we must operate in the worst-case scenario. The planet is now off-limits, and we need options. We have to find a way to extend the lives of 32 people for two extra weeks. It can't be that difficult. She didn't have the authority to transfer all the command codes by herself, but that didn't matter. She had enough clearance to take care of the primary issues. Or at least she hoped she did. Wolf turned to Vreej. What about your canisters? How long can they last? How many do you have? He touched his forehead with two fingers. Her eyes narrowed. What are you doing? What the hell does that mean? Not enough. The air only lasts a few hours. The stasis generators, Zenfor said. The ones you use for your corpses. They have independent power supplies, correct? The question caught Wolf off guard. Because as soon as Zenfor said corpses, her mind had gone back to that dark time of the Hiawatha. Back when she'd had to watch over all the people who had died on that last mission, their bodies being shoved into those shells with an audible schlump and a click. The prospect of spending weeks in there, even if they were still alive, didn't appeal to her. I believe they are, she said. Sester tells me they have individual power units in case of a shipwide power failure, and they don't draw a lot of energy. We could hold the crew in there and rotate out the maintenance crews as necessary. Wolf dreaded spending the next four weeks in and out of one of those tiny shells. Just thinking about it gave her the shudders. How many spots did they have? Two dozen? Maybe a few more? Depending on how many of the maintenance crew were needed at any one time, they might be able to make it work. But they would need someone to induce stasis. Who's still on board that worked in sickbay? she asked. Since transferring over, she still wasn't familiar with everyone's names. It took a certain amount of time to learn who everyone was, and she'd only been on the ship a few weeks, despite the fact it felt like seasons ago when she came aboard at Cypaxia. I believe Nurse Mankel is still on board, Zenvor replied. Fulf tapped her calm. Mankel, report to engineering. A few moments later, a young nurse entered with jet-black hair and a face that had not yet been worn down by the sands of time, though he had traces of stubble poking through his skin. He reminded Wolf a little of Chris, and she recalled passing him once at the corridors. Sir? I mean, ma'am? Whatever. I don't care, Wolf replied. How many independent stasis units do we have in the morgue? 
Um, 25. Why? Damn. That would be cutting it close. Seven people would have to be out at any given time. And there could be no margin for error. Can you induce stasis by yourself? Or do you need help? And can you reverse the process? What's this all about? he asked, glancing from Wolf to Tyler and back again. We're not going down to the surface, Wolf said. We're staying here. What about two of the maintenance crews that were on wave to two? We'll b be short without them, Breach asked. It's like I said, Wolf replied. We don't even know if they're still alive. This will not feel pleasant. And if I thought I could open my supplies without using all the coolant, I'd give you a painkiller. But at the moment, I don't know how much damage I'm dealing with, and you need to use your arm, so here we are. Zax held Cass's shoulder with two hands, and his elbow with the other two. So, what are you... Pop! Cass screamed in agony as the shoulder was forced back into the socket. Motherfucker, that hurt! You could have given me some warning. He rubbed the now throbbing shoulder. That was your warning, Zax replied. I didn't detect any muscle tears or damaged tendons, but it's going to swell, so you need to limit its use for the next day or two, or until I can access our supplies. Yeah, okay. Thanks, I guess, Cass panted, still rubbing the shoulder. Weren't doctors supposed to be gentle? He almost preferred Box's treatment. All fixed? Evie asked, walking up. In no time at all, Zax had set up a temporary medical bay at the mouth of the shuttle she'd come down on. The other shuttles were a few meters away, though they were difficult to see in the low light. They'd come down as the last of the star's rays were licking the sky itself. The space wings had landed further away, in the grassy opening a few meters outside the jungle's edge, where they had been able to make an approach without hitting trees. As far as he could tell, this planet was receptive to their kind of life, though the oxygen content seemed higher than most planets. He tasted ozone at the back of his throat every time he breathed in deeply. And it was muggy, enough so he could see the water vapor in the air, assuming it was water. They hadn't managed much more than basic triage so far, since every shuttle had had injuries. There were no casualties reported, but they were missing one shuttle from the formation. It's the Honduras, Evie said. I checked all the others, and it's the only one missing. Have you talked to the pilots yet? Cash shook his head. He'd barely had time to crawl out of the command shuttle and help the injured, including himself, over to Zack's after everyone had landed. How could I have talked to the pilots? I've been over here getting tortured. Is he okay? Evie leaned around Cass to look at Zack's. He'll be sore, but fine, she replied. Evie stared at him. Go check in while I finish doing an inventory. We need to know what happened and how bad the damage is. And we need to figure out how we're going to take off again. I've already set Zal to working on diagnosing the power problem. Captain, do you need any treatment? Zax asked. She considered it for a moment. I don't think so. I feel fine. Oh, come on, Cass replied. I got thrown around as much as you did. You're only, what, two years younger than me? Three, she replied. And from what Box tells me, you skip your gym time. Maybe if you were a little sturdier, you wouldn't break so easily. There was a smile in her voice that wasn't present on her face. Cass forced his own grin. How about I just go check on the pilots? Great idea, she replied not masking the sarcasm in her voice. Cass grumbled under his breath and held his shoulder as he made his way through the thick brush to the plains where the pilots were helping each other out of their ships. The trees on this planet were tall for temperate trees, taller than he'd seen on other planets, though there didn't seem to be much about them he hadn't seen before. And the jungle wasn't dense, which was helpful. He wasn't sure how well they'd be able to get around if they had to chop trees out of their way to get to the next shuttle, He'd have to compliment the pilots for landing them in such a good spot. As soon as he broke into the clearing, his eye caught the ghostly outline of the planet's rings in the eastern sky, like they were some magnificent castle floating in the dimming atmosphere. 
If this planet did have an indigenous and intelligent species, what had they thought of those rings when they'd first looked to the sky? He hadn't spent much time on ringed worlds and found them gorgeous. From down here, he barely saw a cloud or trace of atmospheric disturbance. So what had they come through? Had the storm moved on that fast? Cass! He glanced over to see Yan running toward him, her flight helmet still on. Is everyone okay over there? We... we lost one. I know, he said. It's okay, don't worry, we'll get it. You guys did great. If it hadn't been for your quick thinking, we'd all be dead right now. When we lost power, I thought it was a fluke, she said. But then we saw the shuttles plummet. Thankfully, the grapplers are on hydraulics, and they have emergency releases. It was just a matter of aiming them. All of you lost power at the same time we did? She nodded. Have you had a chance to check your ships? Is there anything that could have caused the outage? She shook her head. We're still trying to get C out of her ship. The hatch is sealed. We're going to have to break it open. He glanced over to where the other two pilots were yanking on the primary space wing hatch. When he returned his gaze to her, he noticed she was staring at his shoulder. What happened? Popped it out of the socket on the way down, he replied. I guess you didn't see us open the back hatch. Nope. But that probably wasn't the smartest move, with as fast as we were coming in. We tried to slow as best we could, and we picked the best location given the circumstances. How did you communicate without comms? She stuck two fingers in his face and wagged them back and forth. Hand signals of Reed's classic. Makes sense. Can I help with Captain C? She arched an eyebrow. I don't know. How's the shoulder? He thought back to Evie's apparent sturdiness. Well enough to work. 12. Evie squinted at the small but detailed drawing Ensign River had done of the dirt with her fingers. She had to admit, for being nothing but lines and clay, it was surprisingly accurate, though hard to make out in the low light. This is where I think we came in, River said, and this is where we saw the tower. But, based on our heading when we lost power and the speed of our descent, I think we're somewhere over here. She pointed to a small area she'd marked on the ground with a circle. And if we do a little trigonometry, I'm going to estimate that puts us about 30 kilometers from where Wave 1 went down, and at least 15 from where we lost the Honduras. That's assuming it fell in a straight path. The margin of error is about 3 kilometers in any direction. Evie took a deep breath. How long would it take to cross 30 kilometers in this jungle? Are you sure about your measurements? Pretty sure. I have a knack for distances and measuring. River kept her eyes on the ground, refining her drawing to make it more accurate. And Evie realized she still had her ocular implant. Wait a second. All your implants are still working? River glanced up. Yep. No anomalies detected. That has to mean something, Evie replied. Whatever affected the ships didn't affect you. Oh, I guess you're right. She looked at her hands, wiggling her fingers. So my systems are powered by my internal processes. They don't have external power sources. Captain, Lieutenant Uma said, trudging through the brush to get to them. Sax wants to know if she can open her medical containers for the injured. Some of them have moderate injuries. Evie gritted her teeth. Without power, they wouldn't be able to keep all the medical equipment as cool as it needed to be, which meant some of it would become unusable in the moist heat. But it wasn't like they had much of a choice. They had to focus on the injured they had right now, instead of what might happen in the future. Tell her to go ahead and break the seals, but only for what's absolutely necessary. What's the status on comms? Uma shook her head. Zal says without power... There is no chance of reactivating any comms, and re-establishing power should be our first priority. We're not going to be able to set up a homing beacon without anything to power it, River added. My guess is that's why the other wave built that tower. They lost power like we did. Evie grimaced. 
I don't understand how they could have constructed it so fast. River shrugged. They do have Box with them. Maybe he had something to do with it. They would have to find out later when they could organize an expedition toward Wave 1. For now, they had more important problems. As soon as everyone's medical needs are attended to, we need to establish a perimeter around the shuttles, Evie said, turning back to Uma. There's no telling what kind of wildlife might be out there, and it appears we're going to be here for a while. I want three groups. One will be focused on repair, the second will be in setting up an establishing camp, and the third will gather supplies. Do the weapons still work? Uma nodded. Good. At least we don't have to do this with sticks and stones. In all honesty, it wasn't the wildlife she was worried about, though there was always the possibility of large carnivorous creatures prowling around in the dark. Those they could handle. What she couldn't handle were the aliens she'd seen in her dreams, the ones she was sure were on this planet somewhere, and who were behind all of this, including the attacks on the Bulak and the Armada headed for the Coalition. They were on their turf now, and they needed to always be ready for anything. I can have everything ready in an hour, Uma replied. Evie tilted her head skyward. Even though the tops of the trees obscured the sky, she could already tell it was just past sunset. We need to do this now. It will be night soon. I'll head up the group to gather supplies. No one is to leave the shuttles by themselves. Is that understood? Yes, ma'am, Uma replied. Anson, fall in for your assignment, Evie said to River, who was still perfecting her drawing in the dirt. She stood and dusted her hands off. They both followed Uma back to the command shuttle, which was still on its side as it had fallen. Is there any chance of riding this one? Half of the supplies in the shuttle were still strapped down, but instead of being on the floor where they were easily accessible, they were twenty meters up the side of the shuttle's wall. I wish I could say, Uma replied. It's going to take a lot of work. We'll just operate out of the others, Evie replied. You have your assignments. Let's get moving. It had taken half an hour to pry the hatch off Captain C's space wing. Cass was pretty sure the damage they'd inflicted to the ship getting it off meant they wouldn't be able to use the ship beyond the atmosphere anymore as they'd broken the hermetic seals to get inside. He was glad the other three ships hadn't had the same malfunction, though he'd put too much oomph into helping because now his shoulder hurt like hell. So now what do we do, Jan asked, as the five of them made their way back across the grassy area to the shade of the trees. I'm going to start working on finding out why we all lost power. It must be something in the atmosphere, and hopefully it's something we can either block, reset, or turn off before Wave 3 comes down. Cass checked his chronometer on the one scanning device he'd brought with him from the ship, which somehow hadn't been damaged in the crash. They had less than two hours before Wave 3 was scheduled to come down. What's that? Jan asked, looking over his shoulder. Nothing important, he said, replacing it in his belt. Just a scanner. Wait a second, she replied, a smile creeping into her voice. I've never seen a scanner with those settings before. What is that attuned to find? Cass's face went red. Just dangerous animals. It's not often I'm on a planet. I don't see local fauna often. Whatever you say, she replied, it's none of my business. He huffed. Fine. It scans for arachnids, okay? Ever since I ran into them on Regis' ship, I've been on edge. And we're in the middle of a jungle. There's probably millions of them in there. Spiders, huh? she asked. Have you ever been to Parasatia? Not that I recall. They've got this species of spider that will burrow into your ear, and then it goes through some kind of molting process before exploding in size, and all of a sudden one day you have these eight long hairy legs sticking out from your head and a massive headache. I saw them remove one from a guy once. It wasn't pretty. The spider will try and do anything to get out. Cass shuddered. Are you trying to torture me? Jan produced a sly smile. Just making conversation. Jan wasn't normally talkative. At least he'd never known her to be. 
what was going on. For me, it's ursity, though you don't need a scanner for those. You're afraid of bears? Even the small ones? Okay, spend a week on Norcon, then tell me I'm being unreasonable. Claws the length of your hand, and a jaw that can swallow your head whole. I've seen the animals they leave behind, and trust me, it isn't pretty. I guess I never took you for someone who was afraid of anything, Kaz replied. Everyone's afraid of something, even if they don't know it. Cass rubbed his shoulder again. His thoughts drifted back to waking up on that table with a whole host of new organs in his body. It was almost like there was a different person inside him, someone foreign. And just thinking of that other person made him cringe. It was all nonsense, of course. There was no other person, and the organs were just as much his as his old ones had been. But he couldn't shake the feeling something wasn't right about them. That they weren't as sturdy or durable as his originals and that they might fail again. They reached the area where the shuttles had been dropped. Most were in a rough circle, though the largest, the command shuttle, was farther away than the others and still on its side. Some of the crew were in the cargo hold already, unstrapping the supplies. A line had formed at Zax's shuttle, where Cass assumed the injured were getting the necessary medical treatment they needed. He turned to Jan. Any cuts or scrapes on any of you? She turned to Blackfield, Coley, and C, then back to Cass. Nothing we can't live with. If Ryan were here, he could help. He's got some medical training. Cass hadn't known that. Though the man had also just recovered from being stabbed through the back. Maybe that's why he'd been able to survive for so long before Laura and the others got to him at the bay. But he was slated to come down with Wave 3. Cass could only hope they'd find a solution to their power problem before they arrived. Looks like the captain already has things moving. He caught sight of Evie holstering a pulse pistol with some of the other security personnel, including Ensign Talia. The Sargan tattoo made it hard to ignore her, even at a distance. Evie waved Cass over. They had to step over fallen branches and brush from where the shuttles had crashed through the tops of the trees, but for the most part... The jungle floor was free of detritus. It would be an easy place to make camp. Going somewhere? Cass asked as he approached. Perimeter survey, she replied, double-checking the strap on her sword. I need you to get with Zal and find a way to get the power back online, or at least reignite the engines. We need to warn Wave 3. Cass nodded and turned to the pilots. The Space Wings experienced a similar problem at the same time. Had it not been for their quick thinking and the wings allowing them to glide us down, I don't think any of us would be standing here right now. Evie regarded Jan and the others. You saved us all. I'm not sure I can adequately express my appreciation, she said, but thank you anyway. Captain Coley, I want you on perimeter duty with me. Jan, C, and Blackfield, work with Ensign River on accessing the supplies and setting up camp. Are your space wings secured? As well as they can be, Jan replied. Good. She pointed to the sky. It will be full dark soon, and from what we could tell in Tempest, the nights last about fourteen hours here, and I'm not too keen to be caught off guard by whatever might be out there. Whatever you need, Jan replied. Cass took one last look at them, then headed for the command shuttle. It had the largest engines of any of the other ships, and should be their first priority. But he was going to have a hell of a time working on everything sideways. His shoulder still throbbing, he crawled inside the open hatch and worked his way around what supplies the team had already unstrapped. He'd made a similar journey out of the shuttle. But he'd been less cautious then, more in a hurry to make sure the others were okay. But for some reason, it seemed like a lot longer going back inside than when he had come out. On the way, he grabbed a light from one of the supply boxes, as it was dark deep inside the ship. After what had to be ten minutes of climbing over and around sections of the shuttle, he finally reached the cockpit, where Zal sat on the floor, a maintenance panel open before him. Any luck so far? Zal turned, his metal exoskeleton visible beneath his cerulean robes. 
Cass wasn't sure if it had happened during the crash or not, but his hood was torn and no longer over his head, while there were other rips and gashes in the material. The exoskeleton's red eyes gleamed from their artificial sockets, so he looked like a harbinger of death stripped bare. Hello, Commander. I haven't found the problem yet. The captain sent me to help. Then I suggest we begin with the backup power systems and why they did not come online when the primaries died. He gestured to the control panel ten feet up the wall. Sounds good to me, Cass replied, searching for the nearest access panel. With everything on its side, it was a little disorienting. Here. Saul opened an access hatch beside the control panel he was working on. It slid open with a screech, which meant Zolf had probably broken the mechanism pushing it open. But it was large enough for Cass to crawl inside, probably even large enough for him to crouch inside if the ship was right side up. Cass took a deep breath. See you in a few, I hope. He climbed inside, unnerved by the fact Zol no longer had a holographic face to project. Now it was nothing but those blank red eyes staring back at him. Thirteen. Zal lingered long after Cass climbed inside the access tunnel. He was glad his holographic visage wasn't working anymore, as it would show nothing but anxiety and fear. Two of the faces Zal had rarely used on board Tempest. An hour after Caspian had entered the hatch, he continued to sit on the floor, staring at the control panel. He'd never been so terrified in his life. And if he moved... Correction, if he moved the apparatus keeping him alive. He feared it might not work anymore. He hadn't told the captain or Zax or anyone else, but his exoskeleton had suffered damage in the crash. One of the atmospheric regulators had ruptured. Normally, this wouldn't have been a problem, as the atmosphere on starships was constant, stable, and predictable. Not to mention it would have been an easy fix for one of the science labs, but down here, where the atmosphere wasn't an exact match to that Anuntu, it meant he had a problem. The excess ozone would eventually seep into his system and corrode his natural body. He'd already calculated it would take no more than a few days, if that long. This was often the reason he avoided taking part in journeys down to different planets. He didn't like the risk. But he also didn't want to be seen as an unreliable officer, Otherwise, he would have voiced his concerns to the captain before leaving Tempest. He didn't like he was so far away from his altar, as the first thing he would have done after being damaged was to pray to Kor to bring him safely through this journey. But Kor was far away from this planet, and Zol had no way to reach out to him. Or did he? He glanced up to the cracked view screen. Despite the amount of time he'd been sitting there, the sky hadn't grown any darker, or perhaps his perception filters were off as well. But if it wasn't yet dark, it meant he could still make a short pilgrimage. Perhaps there was something on this planet he could connect to after all, a rock, stone, or other mountainous object. He stood, the ribbons of his tattered robe swishing around his metal legs, and began the long crawl out of the shuttle. The crew who had been assigned to remove what supplies they could seemed to have either finished their work or taken a break, as they were nowhere to be found. When he reached the opening to step outside, he paused before placing his foot into the dirt below. This would be the first time he'd been planet-side since leaving Untu, and he was determined not to make it a sacrilegious occasion. He said a short prayer, then took the last step onto the ground, the dirt soft beneath his metal foot. Looking around, he noticed lit torches all around the camp, while clusters of the crew gathered in their soft light. Without power, there were no artificial lights to be seen anywhere in the camp. It was refreshing. It made him want to light a smoldering pyre in Kor's honor. But now was not the time or the place for such an event. In the distance, his fellow crewmates called to each other, probably in the process of staking out a perimeter around the shuttles, Zal turned in the opposite direction, moving around the back of the ship toward the darkness of the jungle beyond. He heard no voices or sounds of anyone close. A proper prayer would only take a few moments, 
then he could return. He could only hope Kor would hear his prayers here and grant him the strength to endure this journey. If he did not, then Zal would very likely die in this place. And that was something he needed to be prepared for as well. Williams, Stillwater, Olguin, you are all on second shift. Relief first as they come back from patrols, Evie said, handing out pulse rifles to the junior officers standing before her. Unak, Amargosa, you two will station yourselves near the command shuttle on the far side. I don't want anything surprising us from over there. The doctor looked timid taking the rifle, but did as she was told, while Unak had nothing but clarity and purpose on his face. Evie split the group almost evenly, with most of her security forces on patrol for the first few shifts. They would catch what was out of the ordinary before the others would, and Evie felt if there was going to be an attack, it would come sooner rather than later. She glanced up to the sky, only to realize the stars still hadn't completely set. The planet must have a longer day than she'd realized. Growing up on Sisk, Especially near the equator, the days and nights were almost identical in length, and each exactly 14 hours long. It had been a big adjustment going from a 28-hour day to a 20-hour day as soon as she'd enrolled in the Coalition. But being in space helped ease that transition. Need some help? Surprised to hear a voice she hadn't expected, Evie turned to see Marshall standing at the edge of the shuttle, his eyes expectantly on one of the rifles. Marshal? I thought you were slated to come down with Wave 3 and the other civilians. I was, he replied. But I have to ride on Circe instead. I didn't want to wait. It isn't often I get to stretch my legs. She creased her brow. No one else had changed their wave assignment, and no one had notified her Marshal was on Circe when they'd launched. Did you stow away? she asked. He shrugged. Does it matter? I'm here now. Give me a job to do. He indicated the rifles with a nod of his head. Do you have any training? You are a civilian, after all. Some, he replied. Well enough to shoot anything that comes running at me with its teeth bared and its claws out. Okay. She took a weapon and handed it to him. I need you to patrol the area between Gramos and Sethirin. Team up with... She checked her memory. Who had she sent over there already? With Lieutenant Handel. You know her? He nodded. Don't lose sight of each other. I'm putting you on a four-hour rotation. Keep an eye out for anything strange. Any movement, you report it right back here. He held up his hand with a comm embedded in the back. Person-to-person -person comms aren't working. Just yell, Evie replied. We'll come running. He nodded, drawing a deep breath in through his nose and seeming to relish it. Nothing like being back on a planet, is there? I could take it or leave it, Evie replied. Marshall slung the rifle over his shoulder and gave her one last nod before turning and heading for the shuttle Gramos. Sometimes it was possible to be too comfortable on a planet. The sound of scuttling woke him. At first it was a small series of scratches, burrowing at the edges of consciousness, and he thought they might be a dream. But as Cass's eyes fluttered open, he realized the sound was real, and it was growing closer. He jolted up, hitting his head on the underside of the tunnel. The small light beside him cast everything around in harsh shadow. He must have fallen asleep while inspecting the backup power systems. He hadn't meant to, but to access the proper systems... He'd had to lie down in one of the adjacent corridors. The excitement of the day must have been more exhausting than he thought, and his shoulder still throbbed from where Zack shoved it back in its socket. But the scuttling... He jerked his head to the sound. It was approaching from the adjacent tunnel, the same one he'd climbed up to reach these systems. His first thought was of those spiders he'd found on Breege's ship. Though they weren't spiders by any normal standard, they had been huge. Reeds had called them Krulax, telling Cass they weren't harmful, just large. They fed on the kind of material Reeds had appropriated from another Bulak ship and grown to be abnormally large. But whatever this was, 
it sounded much larger. And the click-clack-click it made as it climbed up the tunnel produced the image of a massive ten-legged monstrosity making its way through the tunnels. It would have ignored Zal. Of course it would. He was mostly machine. No, it wanted the sweet meat inside, and it had made its way through a small maze of tunnels to reach him. Cass pulled out his scanner and his boom cannon at the same time, pointing them both at the opening of the tunnel. The only other light filtered in for the opening, while a massive shadow made the light rays dance as it moved up the ladder. It had to be a meter in diameter, using its long legs to keep itself braced while it pulled itself up. You're not getting me today, fucker. Cass's hand shook with a finger on the trigger of his weapon. He hadn't even turned his scanner on, and by the time he realized it, a hand appeared over the edge of the opening, the nails on the end of its slender fingers tapping against the metal bulkheads in a rhythmic fashion. Click, clack, click. A half second later, Jan's face appeared, a giant smile on her lips. Cass let out a deep breath and dropped both the weapon and the scanner, willing his heart to slow down. Not funny. You should have seen it from this end. I can't wait to tell Ryan. She lifted herself up into the tunnel, holding out a small cup for him. He stowed his weapon at the scanner again, doing his best to act normal and not hyperventilate in front of her. What's this? Coffee. Rant got the portable unit working. It wasn't hooked up to the ship, so its power level is fine. Had any luck in here? He accepted the cup and took a sip, relishing the taste. It reminded him of the coffee box he used to make back in the reasonable excuse. The really crappy freeze-dried kind that he always threw into the brewer halfway thawed. Cass hadn't realized until now he'd actually missed it after a few seasons of nothing but coalition blend. Nothing yet. What time is it? From what little light that came through the tunnel, he figured it had to be at least dawn or close to. I think a better question, Jan said, tapping the comb of the back of her hand, is how long have you been in here? Because the answers are mutually independent. Cass took another sip. I'm not sure I follow. You've been up here at least four hours. But as best as we can tell, it's still the same time of day out there. Cass furrowed his brow. How was that possible? When we monitored the planet, we didn't notice an extraordinarily long or short day cycle. It was close to what other planets of its size experience. Maybe 25 or 27 hours at most for a full rotation. Jan shrugged. All I know is what I see. Out there, the planet's star hasn't moved any further beyond the horizon than it was when we landed. It's like we're stuck in perpetual twilight. Wait. Did you say four hours? Cass almost jumped up, then remembered the size of the corridor he was laying in. What about Wave 3? Did they come down yet? Captain Diazol has scouts out, but no one has seen them yet. Either they decided not to come after us, or they came down on a part of the planet we can't directly monitor. Something could have gone wrong. Maybe it's better they didn't follow us down. They would have experienced the same problem, which reminds me. He motioned for her to make her way back down the ladder. I'm not going to find anything in here. I'm going to see if I can't ignite the engines directly. Where's Zal? I'm not sure, she replied, already making her way down the corridor. I haven't seen him. He wasn't in the cockpit when you came in? She shook her head. That wasn't like him. Where could he have gone? Cass followed her out through the tunnels into the still sideways cockpit of the command shuttle. When he emerged, his back to the opening, he felt the presence of someone waiting for them in the room. But as Cass turned, he realized it wasn't Zal at all. It was Marshall. Fourteen. Marshall? Weren't you slated for Wave 3? Cass recovered from being startled twice in ten minutes. He shot a glance to Jan, who eyed the bartender with interest. His face was dirtier than normal, and he had a rifle slung over his back. He waved a hand dismissively. I was anxious to feel the ground beneath my feet. How did you get along in there? 
Any progress? Cass narrowed his gaze. No, I was just about to check the engines themselves. Marshall indicated his weapon. Here, I'll escort you. You don't want to go out there alone, especially since the light isn't very good. Are you on patrol? Jan asked, her gaze skeptical. Just finished a shift. Thought I'd come see if I could help. Second shift just took over patrol duty. There was something about his stance and his easygoing manner Cass found unsettling. Here they were, crashed on an unknown planet, with no power, no communication, and no way off. And yet, he was talking like it was the most natural thing in the world, and he didn't have a care about it. "'Aren't you tired from patrolling?' Cass asked, moving around him. Jan followed, with Marshall bringing up the rear. "'Oh, no. I love being on terra firma. Something about the natural world fascinates me, draws me in.' It's less sterile than being on a ship all the time. Cass couldn't argue with that. Here the only constant was the gravity. Everything else, the temperature, the wind, the weather, was all variable, unlike a starship. Even inside the cockpit, Cass could taste just a hint of smoke from something burning outside. As soon as he thought about it, his body decided to reject it, causing him to cough a few times. They made their way back through the sections of the ship, climbing over and around crates, supply chests, and natural obstructions like the partitions between the walls before reaching the cargo area again. The door was wide open, and Cass could see torches had been lit all around the shuttles, creating a makeshift camp. In the dim light, it was hard to make out who was who. He could only see shapes moving back and forth, like shadows on a wall. But at least he'd found the source of the smoke. Did anything else happen while I was working? he asked. The captain wanted to wait until morning before sending out patrols to find the Honduras and wave one. But it looks like she might be waiting a while, Jan said. So who knows? Great. Why couldn't they have landed in morning light? And why was the day on this planet so long? He didn't like the thought of being here for a perpetual night. They needed to get to wave one sooner rather than later and he knew no one wanted that more than Evie. She'd be worried about Laura more than anyone, just as Cass was worried about Box. If Wave 1 fell from the sky just as they had, Box probably would have survived. Probably. Are you okay? Jan asked, the light from a nearby torch flickering over her face. Yeah, fine, Cass said. Just thinking about the people out there. Hoping Raffenkel and the others were as fast as you were with the grapplers. Yeah, me too, she replied. Don't fret too much, Marshall said, walking up behind them. They're resilient, like all of this crew. I have no doubt most, if not all of them, survived. You seem to have a lot of confidence, Cass replied, turning to look at the man. I know that robot. Talk to him a couple of times. He's too stubborn to die, he added, jerking his neck from one side to the other as it produced a series of cracks. Shall we? It almost made Cass laugh, but he refrained, instead making his way around the shuttle and over to the engine compartment. I'm heading back, Jan said. See where I can be of use. Thanks for the coffee, Cass said, only now realizing he left the cup back in the cockpit. She waved as he walked away. No problem. Cass made his way around the far side of the shuttle, with Marshall close behind. He wasn't sure whether to feel safer with a bartender at his back or not. But there was something strange about the man here. He'd never seen him so engaged and talkative. Usually all he did was listen. That and throw Cass out of the bar on occasion. But down here he had an energy that hadn't been present on Tempest. It was like he'd been electrified and come alive, where before he'd been little more than an empty shell. Maybe he was right. Maybe planetary life really did agree with him. Cass hunched down beside one of the primary Exodyne engine coils. Even though it was on its side, he could still access the unit's firing mechanism. But he also needed a few tools to get the casing off. Shit. He should have grabbed them while they were back in the cargo area, climbing over the... Here you go, Marshall said, holding out a small case to him. It was a standard set of engineering tools. What? Cass said before he realized what was coming out of his mouth. Thought you might need them. 
I grabbed them while we were still inside. Cast took the toolkit. Uh, great, thank you. Marshall nodded, then took his weapon off his shoulder. For a brief second, Cass thought he might shoot him. But he turned to the dark woods behind them and crouched down, his back to Cass. Do what you need to. I got you covered. Cass couldn't put his finger on it, but he felt a certain unease with Marshall so close. He'd never felt that way about him before, but there was something off about the man. He tapped the boom cannon under his jacket to make sure it was still there. It wasn't unlike his time with the Sargan Commonwealth. He'd learned the hard way. When someone was being too helpful, it was for a purpose. And they only assisted you until it no longer helped their own needs. Placing the flashlight between his knees, he opened the case and removed the stem bolt extruder. With it, the exodyne casing came off easily, and Cass got his first good look at the shuttle's engine. He checked the power source. No problems there. The injector seemed to be okay. And there was nothing blocking the signals from the command systems to the engine itself. By all accounts, it should be working. The only thing that would stop it would be an interruption of the sequence somewhere. And there wasn't one. At least not as far as he could see. It was just... off. And it made no sense. Cass sighed and sat back on his feet. No luck? Marshall asked. I think I'm going to have to take it all apart and put it together again. It's like it isn't obeying the laws of physics. Bet you're glad you didn't have that drink now, he replied. Tough to work with a fuzzy mind. On the contrary, Cass said. I get most of my best ideas when I'm drunk. Marshall laughed. That doesn't surprise me. Cass reached back in and began disassembling the engine components. He really wished there was more light. This was going to take a while. Do you think you could bring one of those torches over here? He asked. That way I wouldn't have to try and balance this flashlight and work at the same time. Watch the woods, Marshall said, the former good nature in his voice gone. I'll be back in a moment. Cass listened to him shuffle away before he could even turn. The silence around him was unnerving. He clicked off the light and stowed it in his pocket while at the same time drawing his boom cannon from its holster. He didn't point it at the woods, but he did remain very still. Something about the way Marshall had warned him stuck in his brain, and he didn't want to take his eyes off the woods. Beyond the first few trees, it was too dark to see anything. But if he listened, he could make out the call of some alien insects and the rustling of leaves. Could that be the breeze? Or was something moving around back there? He gripped the gun tighter. A warm orange glow appeared. And along with it, Marshall, holding the torch. He planted it in the ground a few meters away from the shuttle. Will this work? Cass nodded, holstering his weapon only when Marshall aimed his again. He didn't know if Evie was right and the aliens were out there. But something was. Spooked? Marshall asked, keeping his eyes on the woods. No, just on edge. Cass kept his eyes on the woods longer than he should have before returning to his work. Speaking of being on edge, Marshall said, though his voice was close to a whisper, how do you think the captain is holding up? Evie? I think she's doing the best she can in an impossible situation. He removed the primary thrust generator, double-checking the connections between the generator and the casing. Everything seemed to be in order. Did you agree with her decision to come down to the planet? Cass turned to him, setting his eyes on Marshall, even though the bartender kept his gaze on the woods beyond. Do you want to cut the bullshit and tell me what you're really asking? A grin formed on Marshall's face, but he didn't turn. Just the thoughts of a curious old man. Nothing insidious. It's just abandoning a ship to come down to an unknown planet is a big risk. I was wondering if you agreed. Yes, Cass replied, wrenching his arm back and forth to remove the assembly coil. I agreed. Like I said, it's an impossible situation. We're 700 light years from coalition space. We have to improvise. That much is true, Marshall said. I was curious if everyone else thought she was doing as good of a job as I did. I can't imagine Captain Green would have ever done something like this. 
Cass had already had that discussion with himself. No, he wouldn't have. But then again, he also wouldn't have let the Bulak on the ship. Eh, Marshall said, as if it were nothing. Don't beat yourself up over that. It was inevitable. And I don't think they'll be bothering Tempest anymore. Not after what you did to their leader. Cass set his tools down and turned back to Marshall. How the hell do you know all this? That information is classified. He raised his eyebrows. Number one rule about being a bartender is you have to be willing to listen. And when you do, you hear almost everything. If that was true, then he was probably right and had access to more information than any civilian should. As he continued to work on the engine, Cass couldn't help but wonder what else Marshall knew and what he wasn't telling them. Fifteen. Evie scanned the woods, staying low and silent. Even though she had the rifle, it was the sword on her back that filled her with confidence. She kept imagining something barreling out of the woods at her, and instead of shooting it, she would drop the rifle, draw her sword, and cleave the creature in half before it even knew what hit it. And while that was technically possible, the actuality of her pulling off such a move was slimmer than she wanted to admit. She was skilled, but not that skilled. It would take a few more years of practice, and she was already weeks behind, having kept the sword out of sight for so long. Perhaps she'd fire the rifle first, then go for her sword. It was honed steel with a carbon composite edge, capable of cutting through almost anything. What could a few gray aliens put up as a defense? If they were true to their appearance in her visions, they'd be naked and unarmed and she'd have no qualms about cleaving them all if she had to. All but one. She'd been in position so long her legs had grown tired, and she shifted them underneath her, so she was on her knees with the rifle still pointed to the woods. She didn't like how long this evening was lasting. While the air was only warm enough to produce a mild sweat, and there was the occasional breeze, the time was stretching on forever. They'd been here six hours, if not more, already, and there had barely been any change in the sky. It should be the middle of the night by now, but the greenish-yellow hues in the sky hadn't waned since they'd landed. Somehow they'd made a serious miscalculation about this planet's cycle and had been right on the edge of daylight when they landed. If sunset took this long, night itself could last for weeks, maybe years, and she had no desire to live in perpetual darkness on this planet, especially without power. A rustle of leaves deep within the forest caught her attention, and she snapped her weapon up where it had been sagging. She glanced over to crewman Barstow, who'd begun to nod off herself. She was only ten meters away, but it was too far for Evie to call out, lest she alert whatever was in the woods beyond. Her hand probed the ground while her eyes never left the dark woods in front of her, searching for something, anything, to get the crewman's attention. Her fingers wrapped around what she assumed was a stick and tossed it in the crewman's direction. The sound made her perk up, and Evie signaled there was something in the woods beyond. Barstow drew her weapon level with Evie's, her eyes wild and the heaving of her chest visible. Evie did her best to still her breath, and yet she knew she'd only feel better once her blade was firm within her grasp. The sound came again, and she could have sworn she saw movement, but it was too dark to tell, and she wasn't about to shoot some native animal that was nothing but curious. If there was one rule of the coalition she wasn't about to violate, it was the protection of native species and their indigenous planets. She made a motion to Barstow to hold her fire until Evie gave the signal. Barstow acknowledged with a nod. The shuffling grew louder and she swore she saw the glint of glowing crimson in the darkness. It struck her that whatever was out there might be a lot faster than she was. Evie had heard tales of creatures that, when they stung you, the venom penetrated your system faster than the human body could send electrical signals. She could be dead before even knowing anything had happened. Suddenly the Coalition's guideline on not killing indigenous animals didn't seem so sensible. She curled her finger around the trigger. 
she caught sight of the crimson again. Only this time it was in a pair. Two red dots moving toward her, and instinctively she tensed before realizing they were not dots, but eyes. Though tattered, she recognized Zal's signature blue robes as he emerged from the woods, his metal exoskeleton exposed to the elements. Lieutenant, she asked. Barstow lowered her weapon with a confused look on her face. I'm sorry if I startled you, Captain. I needed time to pray. His voice was even, almost supplicant. I ordered no one was to go off by themselves. Did I not make that clear to you? He shook his head. I'm sorry. I must have still been in the cockpit when you gave the order. Once Caspian arrived, I left him to his work. Evie stood, not caring about the noise anymore. How long have you been out there? Five hours, forty-three minutes. The appropriate time for a prayer ceremony. She furrowed her brow. Saul? What's going on? You've never been one to go off by yourself without telling anyone. You don't even leave your station at the bridge until your replacement is settled in. I apologize. It was a personal matter. This was what was so frustrating about the Untuburu. She could never infer what he was thinking. She either had to ask outright or assume, and the assumption could be way off the mark. Either way, now was not the time. Did you see anything out there? Anything unusual? Anything we should be worried about? The flora on this planet are unnaturally sturdy. As I'm sure you noticed when the shuttles dropped through the canopy, most of the limbs bounced back. Only a few broke. I found the same to be true in the forest. It takes considerable pressure to fracture these trees. And that means? I do not know yet. I was also approached by an animal, but based on its size, litheness, and lack of carnivorous teeth, I could only assume it was an herbivore and not interested in eating either metal or flesh. How big was it? A meter in height, four limbs, long tail, long snout, black with white spots on its rear and tail. Hoofed animal, most likely belonging to the Cervini of this world. Evie huffed. Anything else? Could you tell if anyone was watching you or watching this camp? I saw nothing of the sort. She couldn't chastise him for being out there for so long and not encountering anything. And now she felt somewhat stupid guarding the camp like a militia. If something were coming for them, wouldn't it have taken Zal and ensured he didn't return? Then again, it was possible they were out there studying them, waiting to make their move. But Evie wasn't about to waste any more time. And since this twilight was apparently going to never end, it was time to act. That's fine. Get back to helping Cass with the shuttles. We need to find a way to get primary power back online. All our systems independent of the shuttles and space wings work fine, but anything built into them is still out. I'll begin immediately, he said, his red eyes boring right through her. As he walked away, she wiped the sweat from her brow, motioning for Barstow to join her. Pull back half of the patrols watching the perimeter. We need to reorganize. Tell them I want to meet with them in twenty minutes. Yes, ma'am, Barstow replied, and took off jogging around the edge of the shuttles to the next closest watch. Evie turned back toward the woods, her eyes lingering on the dark shadows created by the tall trees. She was foolish to have thought they might be here. In her vision, she had seen them at the edge of a great field below a cliff where she and Sester stood, observing them. This climate was completely different. If they were on this planet, they were probably thousands of kilometers away. Still, she wasn't secure enough not to keep the camp under at least minimal guard. They would need every person they could get if they were to find the Honduras and wave one. She only hoped she wasn't wrong. Cass stomped across the area in the center of the shuttles, his face burning. He was covered half in hydrofluid and half in dirt from rolling around trying to access all the different parts of the shuttle's engine casing. After all that work, he'd come up with absolutely nothing. Nothing wrong with the engines, the control systems, the power conduits, the batteries. Nothing. 
It was like electrons didn't orbit protons and neutrons on this planet. Except he knew that not to be true, because things like the stupid coffee maker were working. They could drink as much shitty coffee as they wanted all day long, but they couldn't even turn the lights on in any of the shuttles. It was maddening. Evie must have seen it on his face as he approached her, because she took a step back. No luck? He shook his head. It's not the engines, and it's not the shuttles either. My only explanation is there is some outside force working against us here, something that caused the ships to lose power and drop like rocks out of the sky. I still don't know if it was intentional or a natural byproduct of this planet's screwed-up atmosphere, but I want to take an expedition to find out. I feel like we've run into a giant dampening field here, and if we can just turn it off... She put up a hand. We can't spare anyone for an expedition. We still need to retrieve our crew from the downed shuttle and get in contact with Wave 1. I had wanted to wait until daylight to do this, but it appears we may not have much of a choice. I think you're right, he replied. It may take a long time before we even know how long a full day is on this planet. And the longer we leave them out there, the more vulnerable they are. Do you think Wave 1 saw us come in? I hope so. Maybe they had someone up on that tower they built. Though I think our scanners are off. I'm betting they found that tower. In fact, it may be the cause of this dampening problem. She rolled her shoulders back, pulling her ponytail over her shoulder. I'm sending out two crews. I'll take one to the Honduras, and you'll lead the other one at the direction of Wave One's camp. Based on River's predictions, both of us should be able to make it within a day's time. That's a terrible plan, he said, staring her in the eyes. One of us needs to stay here. The whole reason there are two of us is so I can act as a backup to you. I'll take the team to Wave 1 and the Honduras. That way, I can determine if that tower has anything to do with our loss of power. That's not... But it's what we should do. You're the captain. Your place is here. After we reach the camp, I'll gather everyone together and we'll swing back by the Honduras. You'll have an update by tomorrow afternoon. He glanced up at the sky. Well, maybe not afternoon. Cass? He leaned in. Listen, it's better if I go. That way, if something happened out there to the others, you don't have to worry about your composure in front of the crew. Trust me. He knew how much Evie valued her independence, and he knew he could be pushing too far. But she was basing her reason to lead the team on a false premise. The captain's place was here, so she could coordinate and command, not out in the middle of the woods somewhere. I want you to take Talia and Stillwater. They're both security. Her sour face said it all. She knew he was right. I'll get a team together and confer with you before we leave. She huffed. Get going. We don't have time to waste. We could have injured crewmen out there. Cass nodded. Yes, ma'am. Sixteen. Does, uh, does anyone else have second thoughts about this? Dorsey Ryant asked, staring at the wall of drawers two meters tall and ten wide. You want to suffocate, or do you want to sleep? Wolf came up beside him. Zenfor held her contempt within her chest. It was pointless to squabble, especially over something so simple. They'd be sleeping for a matter of weeks. It wasn't as if they'd be under for years. It's just, uh, I don't like, uh, cramped spaces, Ryan said, backing away from the wall. You fly in a tiny little cockpit built for one person, Wolf retorted. The longer you stay out here, the more of our resources you waste, Zenfor said. The remaining crew and the four space wing pilots had all gathered in the morgue adjacent to sickbay. It was something that would never be found on a sill ship. They did not keep their dead. Not for any amount of time. It was considered inefficient. To have an entire section of the ship dedicated to the preservation of death, she found it fascinating. Right. Ryan said. Sorry, just need to, uh... He jumped up and down, rolling his shoulders. Gotta get in the headspace, you know? 
You're agitating your cardiovascular system, Nurse Mankel said. He had a tray of sedatives laid out beside him. I need you to get inside the shelf, please, Captain. Ryan pushed a series of short breaths out through his mouth. Yep, yep, I got it. Just a few weeks. Won't even know what's happening. He walked over to the lowest row of drawers and pulled one out. A soft hiss accompanied the drawer opening. God, it's cold. You won't feel a thing, Makel replied, sedative in hand. Even though Ryan had dropped his voice, Zenfor could still pick up his soft words. I must be crazy. I have to be fucking crazy. He stepped into the drawer and slid his considerable frame down on the shelf. For a moment, Zenfor thought he might not fit. But the edges of the slab he laid on extended just beyond his broad shoulders. Just lie still, Mankel said, as he placed the sedative against Ryan's neck. He breathed out and shut his eyes while Mankel tapped something on a small monitor above the drawer. He then closed it. Sleep well, Captain. The drawer shut with a clunk and a click. Finally, Wolf said. Now that the drama's over, who's next? Lieutenant Tyler stepped up to the next drawer, glancing back at Zenfor, almost as if he was trying to tell her something in the same way Sester did. But since he wasn't telepathic, she had no idea what he wanted. If he had wanted to tell her something, he should have done it before now. Tyler dropped his eyes and resigned himself, scooting into the next drawer and following the same procedure as Ryan. One by one, the remaining crew of the Tempest submitted themselves to the drawers, there were 24 members of the crew in total, considering one of the drawers still had Captain Green's body inside. Wolf had determined a maintenance schedule where eight of them could stay out at a time and still maintain minimal life support on one deck. If nothing else went wrong, they would be able to last until Sester and Zenfor managed to reset the entire system after the repairs were complete. Zenfor's impatience was getting the better of her, and she almost picked up and shoved the rest of the crew into the drawers herself. Instead, she took a breath and watched as they submitted, as slow as possible. I guess that just leaves you and me, Doc, Wolf said, opening one of the last two drawers. She hopped up on it, her legs dangling over the edge, and turned to Zenfor. Now don't forget, if something goes wrong, wake me. Zenfor nodded. Sester and I can handle it. We'll change out the maintenance crews as needed. Like the doctor said, it is better for you to stay down once you're already inside. I just meant it will be less of a shock to her or any of our systems, the less we have to wake up and go back under, Mangle replied. Okay, then. Our lives are in your hands. As Wolf laid down, Mangle placed the sedative against her neck. The drawer was high, and Zenfer helped him push it closed. Set the coolant to negative six, and the auto-wake to active, and that's it, Mankel said, opening the last drawer. Simple enough. See you in a few weeks, I hope. He pressed the last sedative to his own neck and laid down. Zenfor closed the drawer and set the parameters as he'd outlined. It was done. They were all asleep. The other eight, including Vreej, were in enviro suits up on level seven, inspecting and beginning work on the bridge. It would take them at least four days of work up there before they were set to switch out with eight others in stasis. Zenfor would prefer to keep the same eight awake and working, but a difference in specialties would keep them to their schedule. And if there was something she could understand, it was different people having different skills to affect repairs. Meanwhile, Zenfor and Sester had their own work to do. Despite the fact no one had ordered her to, she was going to spend some time back on level 11, repairing the hull and working on the undercurrent drive from there. She didn't care if it was open to space or not. She was sturdy enough to handle it. And no one could stop her now, because there was no one to stop her. She had free reign on the ship. Forget about someone. The voice came across her mind like a chuckle. Their bond had grown stronger in recent days, so much so that she could detect his thoughts almost anywhere on the ship, and vice versa. Of course not, she replied, but I am anxious to begin. No longer am I constrained by coalition rules. I can remake this ship as I see fit. He chuckled again, as if the wind could chuckle. As long as it gets us back, I don't think anyone cares how you do it. 
The captain would care, Zenfor said. It's best she's not here to watch me undo a hundred years of coalition regulations. I think you'd be surprised. The captain has proven unpredictable in this area. A season ago, I would have said you were right. She would never accept anything beyond what the coalition stipulates as doctrine. But things have changed. Perhaps. She walked over to the control station for sick bay, shutting down all power to the entire section, while confirming the stasis units were operating independently. She wasn't sure she agreed with Wolf's decision to stay on the ship, but given how little they knew about the planet below, she couldn't fault the woman for not wanting to follow the others. If something really had happened to the first two waves, they would be hard-pressed to return to Coalition or Sil space, no matter what condition the ship was in. Sester, I believe we must face a difficult question. If the rest of the crew is dead and does not return, how will we proceed? He was silent a few moments as she made her way through the empty corridors until she reached the access hatches. What few crew remained agreed not to use the hypervators anymore, and instead take routes through access areas only to save power. She reached the first set of ladders to climb back up to engineering. I do not know. We can't take the ship down to find them, and we can't wait here forever. Zenfor made it back up to level ten, faster than any of her human counterparts could have managed. For the first time since leaving Sil Space, she felt a sense of being able to stretch her limbs, to walk around the ship as if it were her own. And despite the lack of people around, it felt more like home than ever before. This was her ship now. The door to engineering rolled away, revealing Sester in his cradle, working on the power systems. She walked over to one of the comm panels. Zenfor to maintenance team. The rest of the crew are asleep. Report progress. Progress is slow. We're still tearing out the damaged sections, which will take the better part of the day, Lieutenant Denner replied. But I sent Vreej and Jackson down to the bay to start refining the raw materials. Very well. Keep me updated. They are a good crew. They'll get the ship repaired. I don't dispute it. Though, if there were eight more shelves, I wouldn't hesitate to seal them all up, so we could do the job ourselves. It would be much more satisfying that way. And take longer, Sester replied. We cannot do everything on our own. While the younger Zenfor might have agreed with him, even chastised anyone who was unwilling to stay within their given assignment, she'd become enamored with the idea of performing multiple different functions at once. It was as if the world had opened itself to her, and she could do whatever she wished, instead of what Sil Society said she had been bred to do. Already she was performing many tasks far outside the range of her capabilities, her most recent being the medical care for this crew. Now she was not only leading the charge to repair, but could enact those repairs herself. She could even design new systems. Being on this ship had given her more opportunity than a Sil found in a hundred lifetimes, and even though the lure took her further and further away from the sanctity of the Council, she no longer cared. She was free to do as she wished, and she was not about to waste the opportunity. She was so giddy she could barely contain herself. But if someone were to see her from the outside, all they would notice was the barest hint of a smile. She sat at one of the design councils and drew up the plans for the ship. Modifications needed to be made. Seventeen. If there was one thing Evie couldn't stand, it was waiting around while others did all the work. She wasn't the kind of person who could sit back when there were tasks that needed to be done. That had been one of the best parts about being a first officer. You carried out the captain's orders while they stayed on the ship. It meant she got to take on the important missions and even be selected for special service as she had been when Admiral Rutledge had come to her with his proposal to retrieve Cass. But now that she was captain, it was difficult not to want to lead the charge in every instance. She'd been so used to taking the initiative, she found it difficult to sit back and let someone else do the work for a while. And it wasn't as if she could tell Cass he was wrong, because wouldn't she have told Green the exact same thing? That it wasn't his place to go out in search of the others when they had no idea what was out there and how dangerous this planet might be? Her place was in the camp, 
just as his would have been. She knew it down to her bones, and yet she disagreed with it. In fact, she couldn't help but keep an eye on Cass as he made his way around the camp, speaking with the individuals he wanted on his team. He'd keep it small, so they'd work as fast as possible. But he'd also pull some good talent. She longed for those days. As she watched, she couldn't help but notice Marshall standing with his back to them, guarding the far side of the camp. He'd taken on two shifts in a row, almost like he was afraid to take a break. She couldn't quite figure him out. Before today, she'd had little contact with the man, usually only responding to his request to retrieve cash from the bar. She wasn't even sure where he was from. She hadn't even bothered to look in the civilian personnel files. But he didn't stand like a civilian. He looked like someone who had military training. Upright, tall, with a rifle pressed against his shoulder and the muzzle pointing up, ready to take anything down to the first sign of trouble. Very strange. Captain? Evie turned to see Zax had made her way over from her shuttle. Her face betrayed a concern Evie rarely saw in the doctor's six eyes. What's wrong? Lieutenant Saul has just informed me he has a problem, though I would call it more of an emergency. What problem? When she'd seen Zal emerge from the woods, he hadn't seemed like there was anything wrong. But then again, he wasn't looking like his normal self these days. His exoskeleton is failing. He tells me it was damaged in the crash. This hyper-oxygenated air isn't good for his natural form and will kill him. Normally, the exoskeleton would prevent this, but the respiratory system has been damaged, as has the primary holding unit. Isn't there anything he can do to fix it? Not without special equipment, and not without power. If I remove Zal from the exoskeleton, I believe he will die within hours. If he stays inside, it will buy him some time, but not a lot. Her two upper hands held each other in front of her. So what you're telling me is we need to get off this planet in the next few hours. Evie tried not to let her panic show. There was no way they could get off this planet that fast, not without a miracle. Why didn't he tell us this earlier? He says he didn't want to add to the problems. He also thought he might be able to find a solution for himself, Zack said. Evie remembered his time in the woods. I would have kept something like this confidential, but seeing as us leaving will directly affect how long he has to live, and there's nothing else you can do? No way to slow the process or put him in stasis? Evie asked. If we had power, maybe. But without anything, I'm at the mercy of what little I brought in my kits. Remember, we thought we'd have access to Tempest Sick Bay in the case of an emergency. Evie shook her head. How naive she'd been. To think they could come and go from the planet as they pleased, as if it were Cypaxia or Earth. She should have known better and now it was going to cost her the life of her operations officer. Do what you can for him. How long do you think he can last? A day, maybe two, if he stays in the apparatus. Evie took a deep breath. By core. Thanks, Zax. She nodded and headed back the way she came. I guess there's no time to waste. Evie turned to see Cass standing off to the side. She hadn't even heard him approach. She was so used to listening to the footfalls of boots on bulkheads, she'd forgotten it was much easier for people to move silently when the ground was soft. No, she replied. Do you have your team ready? He nodded. I need you to be fast, but stay safe. Get to the camp, get to the shuttle. See if they have any idea of what is causing this blackout problem. Then solve it. Saul doesn't have long. Do you have the coordinates? He asked. Evie pulled out a scanner Ensign River had programmed. This has the coordinates for both, and a compass. It should continue to work, but in the case it doesn't, try to stay on a straight line. She set this up as the crow flies. He took the scanner, shoving it in one of his pockets. Who are you taking? Talia, as you suggested, Stillwater, Jan, and Esk. We should be able to cover a lot of ground quickly, assuming we don't run into trouble. You armed? Cass tapped his weapon under his armpit. 
My trusty sidekick and I are ready. And everyone else has their rifles. Jan grabbed two for good measure. We should be okay. She nodded, not knowing what else to say. He leaned in close. Don't worry. We'll find them and figure out what's going on. Expect a call from me on that. He gave her hand a squeeze, indicating her comm unit embedded in the skin below. Good luck out there. You too. See you this evening. He was off. As she watched him gather those who had volunteered to accompany him, Evie hoped she'd made the right decision. Cass strode toward the four others, waiting for him beside the supply crate that held all the weapons. Even though he'd been supportive with Evie, his mind was screaming at him there was no way they would be able to find a way off this planet in time to save Zal. It just wasn't possible. They'd be lucky to get back to Tempest, and returning to the Coalition was a pipe dream at this point, as far as he was concerned. But he couldn't let any of that show. If Evie or any of the crew saw his hesitation, everything would fall apart. And as much as he thought it already had, he was not about to be the reason the last leg crumbled. The crew had to have hope, because without it, they'd all be dead in a week. Headed out? Cast jerked his head to the side to see Marshall standing off to the side, his rifle slung over his shoulder. Yeah, we're leaving to contact Wave 1 and to find the shuttle we lost. Marshall nodded. Don't go looking for trouble out there. Stick to your mission. Nothing good will come from going off on a tangent out there. Okay, Cass said, wary. What was he talking about? And why was he acting so strange? Fortunately, that won't be a problem. We don't have the luxury of time here. That seemed to satisfy him. He nodded, then returned to the edge of the camp, staring out into the darkness. Cass wished he'd waited to come down with Wave 3. Either planetary life was making Marshall a little nuts, or it was screwing with Cass more than he thought it would. Either way, he didn't need the distraction. Ready? Cass asked, approaching the other four. Stillwater had a pack of food and other supplies. Jan had strapped one of the rifles to her back while holding the other in one hand. Talia also had a rifle, but her gaze was toward the woods, searching. Esk had slung the rifle on his back as well, and with one hand he strapped his flashlight to his forearm while supporting a long, strong branch with the other. Cass thought for a second he might find a walking stick of his own to stab any giant spiders they might come across on the way. How long will this take? Esk asked, finishing the wrapping on his arm. He was one of the younger security team members, but Cass had heard he was a good shot, especially in the dark. As fast as we can make it. We won't be slowing down, if at all possible. Approximately 30 kilometers due west. I'm going to estimate 10 hours, depending on the underbrush. Let's try to keep to that. Yeah. Unless we come across an alien life form hell-bent on sucking the blood from our veins... Talia said, her knuckles white from where she held the rifle's grip. We'll deal with that if we run into it. But Zal spent almost six hours out there and saw nothing but a peaceful life form. Anything we come across that isn't threatening, we leave alone. We're not here to upset the balance of this planet's ecosystem. Except spiders, Jan said, suppressing a grin. That's right. Spiders, we blow to hell. I don't care if they're essential to the natural biome of the entire planet. Light them up anyway. Stillwater and Esk exchanged looks. Cass pulled out the scanner Evie had given him. It indicated they head out of the other side of the camp. He motioned for them to follow him as he fished his own light out of his pocket and strapped it to his wrist. He'd prefer not to use it at all if he could help it. But the woods would be too dark to see, and he had to know where he was stepping especially if they wanted to keep that pace. He waved one last time to Weavy over by the command shuttle as they passed by the crewmen standing watch at the west side of the camp. She gave him a curt wave back. They were on their own. Eighteen. Evie walked into Zax's shuttle. It had been nearly three hours since Cass and the others had left, and it was still twilight outside, which she realized was slowly driving her mad. If she didn't see something other than the haze filling the sky, she was going to lose it. Even on the ship, they had a day-night cycle, 
which most sapiens needed. Without it, the constant monotony could drain a crew faster than not eating for a week. But this state of being frozen was the worst. She wanted to scream at the planet's star to set already. But that probably wouldn't be great for morale. Instead, she'd kept herself busy, helping to unload supply crates, checking up on the remaining engineers still working on the power problem, rotating out the perimeter guards as well as helping two different teams consolidate supplies from the command shuttle. The fact was, the command shuttle wouldn't be usable in its current condition, and so she decided to transfer her command post to the Calypso, despite it being on the small side. Not that it mattered. She was so tired of not being able to do anything. It's like the entire world was frozen, and they were stuck on the surface, destined to live out this purgatory until they either starved or died of boredom. How's he doing? she asked, approaching Zax, standing beside the series of alcoves she turned into bed beds. Zal was the only occupant, and since his holographic face was no longer working, Evie had no clue how he was feeling. The only light this deep into the shuttle was a small flashlight Zax had hung by one of the alcoves. The air inside was stifling. They needed to find a way to get a breeze inside. As well as can be expected. I gave him some painkillers, and something to help him breathe a little easier. It's amazing to think an overabundance of what keeps most of us alive is fatal for him. Evie should have known better. He was a member of her crew, and she should have known Untubru don't function well in high-oxygen environments. They had managed to take a visual measurement of the atmosphere from Tempest and determined the air was breathable. But she hadn't considered Zal's suit could be damaged, and the extra oxygen might be detrimental for him. She had assumed he'd be fine, because she'd been too preoccupied with getting the crew off the ship. She'd been so desperate she would have taken any outcome, and now one of her crew might die because of her carelessness. Disgusted with herself, she returned to the evening air. A humidity had settled on the camp, which hadn't been there before, and while not as sweltering as inside the shuttle, it was uncomfortable. Beads of sweat ran down her back, there was probably a nice diagonal stain right where her sword lay against her uniform. When she put the uniform on, she hadn't guessed it might be the last one she might wear, and at the time she hadn't been alone. She'd done everything she could to keep her mind off Laura, but this was becoming a problem. As captain, she shouldn't be so distracted, and this uncertainty about what might have happened to her wore at her like a river carving a valley over eons. The timing couldn't have been worse. Had she still been first officer, they might have been able to make it work, because Evie wouldn't have had the ultimate responsibility for everyone else on the crew. But she did, and she wasn't sure she could juggle both responsibilities. How could she focus on the needs of her crew if she was worried about her girlfriend all the time? She thought by sending her down on wave one, she was proving something to herself, that she could make the hard call and still maintain their relationship. But when they lost contact, all of that had gone out the airlock. She'd opened herself up to Laura, and in doing so, made herself vulnerable. And she wasn't sure anymore that had been the right decision. That was it. If she stayed in this camp waiting any longer, she was going to do something rash or stupid. She'd take a crew to the Honduras and meet up with Cass and the others when they circled around. If the Honduras had wounded aboard... It was better she get to them sooner rather than make them wait for him. How many had been on that shuttle? Five or six? She wasn't sure. Looks like a puzzler. His words startled her, and she jerked around to see Marshall walking up beside her. That was the last time someone came up on her unannounced. She needed to get out of her head and pay more attention to the environment around her. She also didn't like a civilian inserting himself into non-civilian activities. He was being too helpful. Marshall, she said, keeping her voice even. Anything happening out there tonight? He shook his head. It's all quiet. But you look like you're working out something serious. You could say that, she replied. Anything I can help with? She eyed him, looking for any signs of deception or subterfuge and finding none. He seemed genuine, 
But Evie had been fooled before. She'd already told herself to be more skeptical, more discerning. No, just planning the next stages of our time here. We're not going to sit around and do nothing. We need to find a way to notify Wave 3 before they come down, if they haven't already. What about the downed shuttle? he asked. I'll be taking care of that personally, she replied. Is there something you needed? He shook his head. No, ma'am. Just coming off my shift, switching out. You've been up nonstop since we've arrived. His face was unreadable. So have you. She scoffed. It's part of the captain's job. Don't worry about me. Maybe it would be better to wait until we have better light before heading out. We don't need two teams lost in the woods. With all due respect, she said, keeping her temper, that's not your decision. If this planet is turning as slow as it appears, it could be weeks before we see daylight. And our crew doesn't have that much time to waste. She paused, reading his face for any signs of anger or surprise. You may carry that rifle for us, but you're not a coalition officer. And I'll thank you not to interfere in the chain of command. He put his hands up, supplicant, just trying to help. He turned, heading for one of the supply shuttles with the water. She didn't need his help, and she didn't like how close an eye he was keeping on her. Had he always been that way? Or was this how he acted when they were stranded on the surface of a planet? She didn't want him following them out, either. As soon as she was sure he wasn't paying attention, Evie made her way over to River, who had taken up position by the Calypso. I need the coordinates to the Honduras, Evie said. River pulled a scanner out of her pocket and then put the coordinates. Another one? What about the first mission? I don't want our crew waiting that long, she replied. Their injuries might be severe. Where's Lieutenant Uma? River pointed to the shuttle on the far side of the camp. It was the one they'd been using as temporary barracks until they could get something more permanent established. Taking a break, I think. Thanks, Evie replied. Keep this up, and you might earn a promotion before this mess is over. River beamed. Evie still hadn't had an opportunity to check the logs as to why she'd lost her hands, but she supposed it didn't matter. River had proven herself in a crisis more than once. Evie crossed the camp, minding her footfalls. If everyone else could creep around without making a sound, so could she. She reached the barrack shuttle, and once inside found Uma on one of the lower bunks. She gave her a gentle shake to wake her, and Uma jumped with a start. Shh, it's Evie. I need your help. Captain? Uma asked, her eyes bleary. What's wrong? I need to take a team out to find the Honduras. Based on how long Ensign River said it would take Cass to get to Wave 1's site and back over there, I'm afraid it might be too long. We need to try and reach them sooner. Uma nodded, retrieving her weapon from under the pillow she'd slept on. Gather a small group. No more than three others. I want to keep this light. I know just the people, Uma replied. And one other thing. Don't let Marshall see you. Five minutes later, Evie stood on the far side of the shuttles, staring at the small tracker River had given her. While trying not to think about whether this was a good idea or not, Uma appeared, towing Carson, Vostokov, and Williams. Vostokov and Williams were two of her best security officers, and Carson had been in the medical field for over five years and was trained in field triage. She'd figured Uma would bring him with them. He was the only other medical personnel that had been in Wave 2, other than Zax, and they needed someone who could take care of any injuries aboard the Honduras. The fortunate thing had been the shuttle had been carrying mostly supplies and hadn't had a large crew. Uma handed Evie an extra pulse rifle she'd procured. Ready to go? Evie asked. They all nodded without question. Did Marshall? Uma shook her head. I made sure we stayed out of his sight, but I'm not sure if I know why. Evie dismissed the concern with a wave of her hand. It doesn't matter. Let's get going. I don't want to make a fuss leaving, either. We're leaving camp as quietly as possible. She noticed a few of them try and hide their confusion or concern, but she didn't care. 
Sometimes the captain asks you to do things, and that's just how it was. It didn't matter how much you agreed with the order or not. You followed it. It was strange to be on the other side of that exchange. Placing the tracker device in her pocket, Evie double-checked the rifle wasn't active and hooked it around the opposite shoulder from her sword. She hadn't planned on taking a gun at all, but not doing so would look suspicious, and she wasn't about to argue with Uma in front of the others. She'd take the stupid thing, but it didn't mean she had to use it. She peeked around the edge of the shuttle, scanning the camp for Marshall. He was on the other side near Zax's shuttle, picking through one of the food containers. She pulled back around and nodded to the others to follow her out into the woods. As they stepped into the darkness, she hoped none of them caught her slight hesitation at leaving the camp. Because as determined as she'd been, she realized it might not be the smartest idea. But it was too late. She was committed. Nineteen. Box had been right. Cass was out of shape. By the time they reached kilometer thirteen, his calves had begun to seize and release, and his ankles were sore. Even his midsection gave him cramps. How long had it been since he'd done any rigorous exercise? He hadn't considered he might be the one to slow them up, and he wasn't about to succumb to a soft body. He'd have to push through. There was no other way around it. All he had to do was put one foot in front of the other, keeping the light low and steady, and not turning to the rest of the group so they wouldn't see the sweat streaming down his face. Much of the jungle floor had been unobstructed, allowing them to maintain a good pace. Only in a few places had they come upon a fallen tree or other obstacle that needed traversing. They crossed two small streams, one which had spread further than its boundaries into kind of a shallow marsh, but it hadn't lasted long. For that, Cass had insisted they all use their portable repel fields in the event an alien insect could be carrying a hostile disease. While the Coalition had some of the best immunity blockers in the known galaxy, they were still on a planet far from Coalition space with exotic animals and even more exotic diseases. The last thing they needed was to become sick and die before they even made it to the camp. This was the reason he enjoyed the sterility of space travel more than planet work. It had also been one of the reasons he'd been more than happy to courier for Vina rather than work on Cassiopeia or Vitar. Space was just so much easier. He hadn't been sure he could make it, but by the time they reached kilometer 28, Cass caught something in the wind, the smell of something tangy in the air he hadn't smelled before. It was the smell of civilization if such a thing existed. Broken trees and the scent of fuel combined with metal. It was a far cry from anything they'd smelled thus far on the journey. Regardless, he was grateful. His legs were worn out, and he needed respite, if only for a few minutes. Pretending to be in shape was a lot harder than it looked, but he couldn't let his exhaustion get the better of him. The closer they came to the camp, the more his heart rate picked up, he held the group back, even though he couldn't yet see the camp itself. We'll go in quietly, he whispered. I don't want them shooting us by accident. With this low light, it's hard for anyone to see anyone else. Stay behind me, and hopefully we won't surprise them. They all motioned an acknowledgement, and Cass found the ache was gone from his legs. His heart was palpitating about what they might find there. Whether they'd find Box and Laura alive along with the rest of the crew... Though if something happened to Ravenkill, he couldn't necessarily be upset. He tried not to have any expectations about what they were approaching. But he couldn't help letting his mind wander into dark places. As long as Box was all right, they could get out of this. He pressed forward. As they approached, Cass was eerily aware of the lack of sounds emanating from the area. There was no breeze, nothing to move the trees or limbs, but also... All the background noise they'd heard on their journey had disappeared. It was as if everything around them had been turned off. And if the camp was directly ahead of them, the crew of Wave 1 was being much quieter than their counterparts back at the other camp. Cass pushed a few branches to the side, revealing the camp. Much like Wave 2, most of the shuttles were arranged in a rough circle, all of their cargo hatches open. 
Some of the crates had been spilled out, while others remained sealed in their places. Cass held everyone in place for a moment as he surveyed the scene. In the center of the camp was the base of the tower they constructed, obviously from parts taken from the Fingari. Parts of its shell remained off to the side. There was evidence they had used torches and other pyres for light, but they were all dark, long since burnt out. Cass approached the nearest one, putting his hand on the ashes. They were cool to the touch, no hint of having been lit any time recently. As best he could tell, the camp was abandoned. None of this made sense. Wave One had only been an hour or two ahead of them. How could they have disassembled the shuttle so fast? And why hadn't they focused on finding the source of the power drain? Cass tried to think. Where could they have all gone? Fan out and search the camp, but do it quietly. They might be hiding somewhere close, Cass whispered. He could see no movement, hear no rustle of leaves or brush. Something was very wrong here. With his weapon out in front of him, Cass searched the closest shuttle, only to find most of it emptied or damaged. From the way things were tossed around, it seemed something large had gotten inside, but he couldn't be sure. When he tried the control panels, he only found the same problem that had plagued them back at their own camp. Everyone hadn't been killed in the initial fall, and it even looked like they'd managed to save all the shuttles. So where were they? Hey, Cass, Jan whispered from the end of the shuttle. She motioned with her head for him to follow her. Find someone? Maybe. She pointed to a part of the bottom structure of the tower. On it, there was a dark crimson mark, like a splatter. Cass bent down, putting his nose close to the stain, and not liking what he found. It's blood, isn't it? He nodded. Jan pointed to one of the overturned crates, and Cass caught a glimpse of another dark splatter. Then another on a makeshift table that had been knocked over. All over the camp were splatters, and in some cases dried up pools of crimson. And from some of those pools, marks that headed out into the woods. Whatever it was, killed them, then dragged the bodies away. Still water came up beside them. No bodies anywhere in the camp. No robots either? Cass asked. Haven't found him yet. Keep searching. For footprints, trails, marks, anything. We have to know what happened here. He tried not to let his mind go down the path of what he was going to tell Evie. If every member of Wave 1 had been killed, that was another 40 personnel, most of them security or tactical, which of course included Laura. Cass couldn't believe they would have gone down without a fight. He began searching for evidence of weapons fire, but if they'd been shooting into the woods, he might as well be searching for a rogue planet. X came up beside him. Looks like most of the food is gone. Either whoever attacked them took it with them, or they destroyed it. Some of the medical supplies are still here, and all of the backup equipment. Cass sighed. Without power, that equipment was nothing but dead weight. Leave it. Leave all of it. What about the weapons? Cass shook his head. If whatever took them hadn't taken the weapons with them when they attacked, they wouldn't come back for them. Evie had been right. The aliens were here on this planet, and they were ruthless bastards. Everyone, stay sharp. They may have left someone to watch this camp. We need to head for the Honduras. They were all smart enough not to groan or complain, despite the fact they just walked 30 kilometers. Cass's legs were screaming at him, but he wasn't about to stay here in this death pit, and they needed to get back. What if the same thing was happening to the second camp at this very minute? Though aliens attacking the camp didn't explain what happened to Box. Unless they disabled him and took him with them. For what reason, he couldn't fathom. Cass made a motion with his hand, his boom cannon still ready. Let's get out of here.